All right, here's my problem. I have these cubes that are instanced in geometry nodes. My problem is there's a bit of flexibility that I don't have because I can't just in the viewport, click a cube and pull it and move it and animate it because that's not how geometry nodes works. So to get that kind of control, I bring you the index node and the position node. Now, the index node, he knows something that none of the other nodes know, and that's every single instance here has a number assigned to it, like it's the name of that instance. And he's able to call that name so that we can move him, rotate him, make him bigger, really do anything you want with that little spot in that area. And then the position node is quite similar to the index node, but instead of knowing a particular name of the instance, we're able to control things based on position. Now, knowing how to use these two nodes and often at the same time allows you to make some incredible animations and lets you keep everything completely non-destructive and totally procedural. So in this video, I'm gonna show you several examples of how to use these nodes in different contexts and examples so you know exactly how to use it for your own ideas. And at the end, we're gonna make a complete animation with it so you can walk away with something really cool. If you're new to geometry nodes and you want to follow along, go ahead and hit Shift A, get just any piece of geometry, head to the geometry nodes workspace and click new. All right, let's quickly look at how these two nodes work. I have a mesh line and I instanced 30 cubes on that mesh line right here. I'm gonna get a node that's gonna allow me to rotate these instances. I'm gonna get a combine XYZ so I can rotate just a individual axis and plug a position into the Z. And you'll notice this happens. If you get a math node set to multiply, which multiply I like to look at is like a strength slider, you can actually adjust the strength of this effect just like this. If I get an index node, a math node set to compare, and I tell it use object number 15, and I plug it into selection, it's only going to apply that rotation to object number 15, or, or I can say all the other objects right next to number 15, and you can now get that. Now, by the end of this video, hopefully you're gonna know how to use these nodes and know how to apply them to tons of your own ideas. Now, if you are a member of my Patreon, I have four tutorials totaling 101 minutes that are gonna show you practical application of these techniques from start to finishing a really beautiful animation. So if you end up having trouble coming up with some really creative ideas for these nodes, those tutorials are really going to help you. If you wanna check it out, that is linked in my bio and you can get 10% off if you subscribe annually. All right, to show you how to practically use the index node, we're gonna create this hexagon grid. All right, so in Geometry, let's go ahead and set up a grid and a instance on points node. I'm gonna get a cylinder node, plug that in, bring my radius down, my depth down, and I'm gonna give myself six vertices. On the Z, just rotate it by 90 degrees to set them up like this. So now let's go ahead and get that index node working for us. So we're gonna get a set position node because we want to change the position of every other one of these hexagons to fit them in the middle rather than them right on top of each other. I want to offset them. So we're going to get a index node and we're going to get a math node to get the index node working. So plug the index into value, plug value into selection because we're making a selection. Now what I know is that if I get every other one of these hexagons to move over a little bit, it's gonna fit right in like a glove. So that function is called modulo. And what modulo says, if I give it a value of two, meaning select every other one of these instances, then if I just move it over on the X, it is going to move every other one. So it's saying, skip him, use him, skip him, use him. And then once we get to the top, go back to the bottom, skip him, use him. And so it's moving them all over and you get this really nice hexagon grid that you can then do whatever you want with. The index node, of course, knows the numerical value of all of these indexes. So he knows how to go, hey, this guy goes, hey, I'm able to tell you to skip every other one. I know which ones can be skipped. Let's communicate and move it. So that's how this works, using modulo to skip every other one. Now, if I used compare and bring your Espelon to zero, I can say, just move over the second one or say, let's move over the 30th instance. And now we can move instance number 30 by itself. And using the compare node allows you to type in an integer. Say we bring him up, S1 goes, now pick all the ones that are next to it. Just like that. That's how you use it in the most simple way. Now, practical application of this might be if you're doing product animation and you have, say, 20 iPhones. You grid out 20 iPhones and you're able to animate one coming up, kind of rotate, he spins, he gets bigger, and whoop, 
he goes right back down to the ground. So this may seem very simple and kind of boring, but the application of this is all about having control over a procedural system. All right, I'm gonna show you how to use the position node, and this is actually gonna highlight the biggest difference between the position and the index node. So go ahead in geometry nodes and get a grid, size it to 10, and give yourself 12 vertices on each. We're gonna get a instance on points node, and just like in the intro of this video, we're gonna get another cylinder, bring the depth down and the radius till they're not touching. So to get these guys to rotate in that gradient, we're gonna get a rotate instances node. So I have the index plugged into a viewer, and of course, this is his vision. This is what he is able to see all of these numbers, and we can tell it, grab 65, grab 101, or grab number 30, whatever. But let's talk about the position node, which is kind of about your X, Y, and Z. So if I go ahead and get a combined X, Y, Z node, which will allow us to plug a rotation into a specific axis, and we'll plug that into the rotation. If I get a position node and I'll plug him right into the X, we're gonna get this really cool system. Of course, we can't animate it until we add a math node and this little value slider right here on the add node is gonna let us animate um, just simply what already is happening. Now what happening is it's rotating each of these lines based on their position. So as you can see, as he goes, it's more and more rotated. So it does sort of like a full 180, something like that. And you can see how it's repeating that. And then as we go up, it's starting to move that over, creating this really interesting wave. Now I plugged in an index node and he kind of does the same thing. He says, instead of its position from each other, it's the index. So he's going zero, one, two, three. So the higher the value, the more of the rotation. So it's doing a very, very similar behavior from the other one. Again, position goes, rotate it more based on the position of where it is. So starting here, rotate and go more and more and more and more and more and more. Index goes based on the value, zero rotate this way, one, two, and it's doing it the higher value, the more rotation happening. Let's draw a very important distinction here. These objects are rotating on their X axis, but if I get a separate X, Y, Z, you'll notice nothing changes. So if I play with this add, everything's going on and I'll switch this over to the Y and now they're rotating on their Y axis, but notice something. There's a sort of movement happening from right to left. See that? You can kind of notice this wave effect happening from right to left and I switch this over to the X. That wave from right to left, if you're able to recognize it, and if you can't quite recognize it, if we go ahead and throw a multiply, which is sort of like a strength slider, it'll make that, it should make that wave effect a little bit more obvious, but you can see some kind of mo movement happening from left to right, right? And if I switch this over to the Y, nothing changes and I can't control it. What if I want that wave to be this way instead of this way? That's where the position node is really gonna make a big difference here. So if I plug him here and I just move him out of the way and say, I'll bring that multiply. And so let's say, rotate it from the X on the X. And if I play with this value, you'll notice how these guys are behaving. And maybe I can just sort of strengthen this wave here. So if I play with it, you'll notice, notice where these guys are rotating and notice where this kind of wave is happening from. See that? And then if I switch this Y, now it's going from top to bottom. And then I can switch this over to the Y. So now these guys are gonna rotate from there, oops, it's combining them. Now these guys are gonna rotate from their Y. So we'll do that again. We'll put it on the X, rotate it on the X, play with that value and it's going to do that. And then we can go from the Y, use the Y and it's going to do that. And that's because the position node actually takes into account the X, the Y, and the Z, and the index can only look at those numbers and rotate those. So he's a little limited on that side, but of course the position is also limited in its ability to recognize a single object, it can't do that. So in this Patreon tutorial, I had this grid of hexagons, but I wanted to have these little rods going through the middle of it to look like they're spinning on those rods. So I needed to get one strip of geometry from the original grid so that I can just instance one thing on each one of those pieces, meaning I had to take the original grid, delete everything except one little strip, and I needed the position node for that. 
Now, if that didn't make any sense, let me show you what happened. I went and got a grid, plugged it in and scaled it to 10 and I'll also give myself 10 on the vertices. If you get a delete geometry and say delete faces, you can get a position node and go plug this into the selection. Of course, we need math nodes to get this to kind of read properly. So if I click on add, you can see it's starting to delete it combining on all of the axes. So if you ever looked at normals, you kind of recognize this behavior. So what you have to do now is just get a separate X, Y, Z and go, oh, I only want to delete it on the X axis, right? And then there we go. We now have just one strip of geometry that I can instance some of those cylinders on to get it to sort of be in the middle of all of those hexagons. Or, or of course, we can just delete things on the Y just like this. And of course, you can get a color ramp or a map range to invert this selection if you want to use the opposite geometry. And the index node, he is only able to delete a specific face and then ones next to it, or say we can delete every other face. That's what the index node would be really great for. But in this exact situation, the position node is perfect just so we can isolate a strip of geometry from a system that we were already working on so we don't have to sort of line things up or get new geometry. This helps us stay procedural. All right, this is the part of the show where Larry Boy gets to slow down and make a full animation with you guys so you can walk away uh, with an animation and some other practical tools. Let's make something. All right, so we are gonna go ahead, get a piece of geometry and head into geometry nodes to make something. So we're gonna click new and let's go ahead and get a mesh line. And we're gonna just plug him right into the geometry. Now what I wanna do, I know there's 10 spaces right here. So we're going to go ahead and get a instance on points, plug him here, and we're going to get a grid. We're going to plug him here into instance, and we have these guys, so we'll just scale them to some desired size. And then in the wireframe view, you can kind of view it, we can go ahead and also kind of subdivide them to, you know, just kind of eyeball it because this is all changeable throughout the process. In the viewport, I'm gonna get a cube and add a bevel modifier. Typically, I'll just use a cube uh, node in geometry nodes, but you can't bevel that. So we're gonna do it outside of geometry nodes. So now we have all of these new points on these planes here. So what we can do is now instance on those points. You can drag your cube into the scene and plug him right into instance. And then you can just click and drag here. And we have all of our nice, very nice, very kind cubes doing what they do. Now let's go ahead and make sure these guys are actually stacked together. So you can go back to the original mesh line and bring it down until they're right about there. So now we have this really cool looking scene and they're all sitting on top of each other. Now what I want to do is um, delete some of these cubes kind of randomly to create a really interesting uh, look, just some detail here. So what we have to do is to get a separate geometry. Get that separate geometry node and we'll just uh, delete, we'll delete points. The thing we're going to use to delete the points is a noise texture. So we'll get a noise texture here and a color ramp to sort of strengthen the uh, effect. So we'll plug him into selection and then we should be able to, yep, delete some of those points. Of course, it's deleting the same cube on all the planes. I wanted to kind of treat it across the board. So what you can do is get a realize instances node to rasterize all 10 of these grids that we created, plop it there, and now it's going to delete it. Uh, it's gonna be kind of fair across the board. I'm gonna do is uh, bring the detail down and bring my scale to a value of one just to get sort of these bigger points of deleting and then you can just kind of do Actually, maybe we'll bring the detail um, To the max So we can get something like this. I just want to sort of randomly Delete cubes so it feels I don't know a bit organic now let's go ahead and use the index node to uh, grab one of these cubes so that we can uh, animate him to kind of fall down into place. 
So because we created the instances here, it's the instances that we've created sort of after this right here, we can go ahead and throw in our set position node. So we'll plug him here and then we need a selection. We need to select our cube. So what we can do is get in a index node plug him into selection, but of course we don't have anything saying what particular index are we supposed to grab here. So we're gonna search up a math node and of course go to compare. And what I'm gonna do here is say, we'll grab number eight and I wanna bring him on the Z up so you can see it working. He's moving right there. So what I wanna do is there's no really easy way to go, I wanna grab him because if we were to view, because if I were to go ahead and view the instances, it does this, I don't know a way to be like, oh, what's, what's this guy's instance? It's easier when it's far less instances. So here's the trick to do it in this like particular uh, spot. Just bring your Espelon quite big and then bring your value and you can start to see it happen down here. As you bring your value up, you can see it's kind of going across. See how it's grabbing them? So we can just drag it, drag it, drag it, drag it until... All right, I think we're at the top. Yep, now we're at the top. And so now we're here, and then you can bring that Espelon down until we have him. Cool. And then you can bring that value over. Right there is probably a good one. Okay, so now we have him. We've isolated number 3055. So we've now, this value associates with this cube right here. And I can go ahead and turn on all of my little viewport tricks to make everything look pretty. Now you can do the same thing by getting a rotate instances node, plugging that into selection so that we can also rotate him and we can animate him. So let's go ahead and get the animation out of the way so that we can live our lives. Um, in your preferences, make sure your default interpolation in the animation tab is Bezier. Um, that's gonna make your life really nice. And so what we can do is bring this guy Bring this guy high up. Let's get our camera angle first so we know that the cube is um, going to be above the camera angle. So I'm gonna do Control Alt Zero, snap it to view. And then I love orthographic for stuff like this. So we're gonna, we're gonna orthodontist this guy. Here we go. All right. So now if we bring him down, let's see, is he in the middle of the scene? Sort of, we can just go ahead and rotate our camera, very nice. So now we know, okay, so we'll start him here. We'll get our keyframes. I'm gonna hit I, go maybe to like frame 60 and then zero. So let's see how that looks. Sweet, we can just bring it down. And then of course, rotations are always pretty. And so we can start him, let's see, where do we want him to start? We want him to kind of move that direction. So we'll start him backwards. What about 180? So we'll start at a rotation of 180. And then where does he stop? Frame 60. So frame 60. And then of course, a rotation of zero. Hopefully this lines up properly. Perfect, all right, cool. So now we procedurally can slot this guy in. And you could slow it down if you want it to be a little bit more elegant, uh, but now we have that. And so what we can do now is just focus on the shading and the lighting and uh, call this a day. So there's a few things that I wanna do. Let's go ahead and create a material. So go over here, create a new material. He's just called material, so we'll get a set material node and grab him. So now that we have that, you can head into your shading tab. I'm gonna head into the main view and we're gonna switch into cycles so we can see this. First, let's get our HDRI. I pretty much exclusively use HDRIs from Polyhaven. They're totally free. And so go to the HDRIs and head to the search bar. If you have the Polyhaven add-on, which is worth the $30, it's maybe the one of the most worth it add-ons for time. You can click on your HDRIs and the particular one that I used, you can either search in the website or in the add-on, is the 
uh, Rostock or Rostock arches. And so we can throw that in there, and that is the only um, the only HDRI we need. It's one of the few HDRIs that really does a lot of work for you. Now here on this uh, material, we're gonna turn on subsurface, give it a nice blue color. Here on the radius, bring everything to a value of one, and then you bring your scale up to allow more color in. And then what I love to do is bring up a coat to make it very nice and shiny and reflective, and then maybe bring up your roughness a tiny bit here. And we have this, but what I wanna do is the object that we're moving, I want him to be white, and then I want all the other cubes to have either a blue or a white material added. So we need to create randomness and we need to create an ability to select our individual cube by himself. How do we do that? So we have to go back to geometry nodes and create two attributes. And so here's what we're going to do. Let's get a store named attribute. And the first one, we're just gonna call it random and we want the attribute to look at our instances. And we wanna get a random value to plug into value. What this is going to do is just assign a random black or white value uh, to all of these instances that I can then manipulate that in uh, the shader editor. So let me show you how that works here. So if we head back to shading, if I go ahead and grab an attribute node and type in R A N D and tell it, use the instancer and we plug factor into base color, if you'll do that. You can kind of see it working. Of course, we won't be able to fully see it working until I go ahead and get a color ramp, get white and blue, and then just use a constant and then bring him in the middle to get a random selection of white and blue cubes, which is beautiful and wonderful and great and we love it and we want more of it. Now, let's go ahead and create one more attribute that will highlight number blah, 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 blah. So I'm just gonna give myself a little bit more room here, get another store named attribute. We're just gonna call this A. Of course, pick that instance and we'll just plug the compare right into the value because we've already made this selection here and here. And we could just call to it here as well. So if we head back into shading, we can go ahead, get a color ramp plug it into, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize my subsurface and my coat and bring up my emission, give myself a strength of 10 and then plug color ramp into color and then we'll get another attribute node and grab a instancer factor. And there he goes, he now has emission assigned to him. So if I just go ahead and look at it in sort of the full viewport, you can see our very bright cube in our nice, wonderful scene. And he goes down right into his spot in a very beautiful way. To kind of finish this off and make it look pretty, I would say bring uh, the brightness of your HDRI down a little bit just to draw a little bit more attention to this guy. In the compositing, I would use a glare node, set it to fog glow and bring the size to nine. And then you can go ahead and preview that by clicking on always and going, okay, cool. In the shading, let's go ahead and turn on always. We can go and say, hey, bring the strength down a little bit. We just want him to glow some and maybe be slightly blue. Nice. Now he's losing a little of his definition. You can add a, a layer weight to kind of call to attention some of the geometry. You can kind of have some fun with that if you want, um, but we, are done. You can go ahead and render this out. I recommend using a PNG sequence. Now you know how to use the index node, you know how to use the position node, and with this last exercise, you kind of have a way to really associate it with different components and all that fun stuff. It's a really powerful node for making some really cool motion graphics. I've been using it for like two weeks now, and it's just been so fun and unlocking a lot of really cool potential uh, with what I can make. So hope you guys learned some stuff. Hope you're able to apply this to some other ideas, and I'll see you in the next one.